G'day guys, John here, Chief Instructor with FPV Australia. Today is the 24th of March, 2017, and I thought I'd do this little video as there's now quite a number of flight schools, uh, drone flight schools that is, popping up all over Australia, and I guess I'll address the elephant in the room, which is, you know, what is the difference between all these flight schools? There's a summer two-day course, three-day course, five-day course, seven-day course. You know, what, what are the differences? What are you likely to expect as, as far as outcomes? What are you gonna learn about? All that sort of stuff. So I can try and give you an idea on what we do. Um, so I guess first and foremost, I'd like to start with the, the certification itself. It is issued by CASA. It's not issued by the flight school. Um, so we don't actually issue your license. What we do after you come to us and sit our training courses, we give what's called a recommendation to CASA that they uh, issue a certification to you. So we don't do that. Um, secondly, they've laid out the benchmark of what is uh, required on a training course, I guess. So when we started back in 2014, we had to present our, curric our, our course, our courseware to CASA. They look at it, they go, yes, this meets all of the, the required criteria and away we go. We've got you know, uh, demonstration, flight demonstrations that we need to do that CASA have issued. So it's all above board as far as CASA is concerned. So there's a level there that we all are supposed to meet. Um, but further to that though, I guess, is what the flight school wants to either value add or shortcut. I guess is probably a good way of putting it. So what I'll do is I'll talk about what, what we do on our course. Um, I, I, I sort of can't comment on what other, what other organizations do. I can only tell you what we do and, and what you'll get out of our five day course. And with the magic of video post-production, we're gonna look at some stuff um, as to what you will get and what you will, what you will see and, and what you will learn. So first and foremost, uh, day one on our course pretty much starts with um, all of the terminologies that you're gonna find in aviation because we, we don't talk in meters and kilometers much when we, when we talk aviation. We, we have to change the way we think and our measuring uh, is all done in nautical miles. So if you're at, you know, near an airport or near something, near a helipad, it's all measured in nautical miles. Uh, so we talk about that and how we work that out and all that sort of stuff. Same as height, uh, we're not talking in, uh, in meters anymore. When we're talking height in aviation, we're talking in feet. So you'll hear a lot of 400 feet and, in, and you, you might know it as 120 meters. Um, 400 feet, we start using feet. So I, I actually encourage people with all the DJI product to go and change to, to uh, imperial measurements so you can get feet, not meters. Okay, cool. So we talk about that. We talk about um, wind, wind is in nautical miles, all, all the terminologies that happen in aviation. That's where we start. We then we move into um, airspace maps and frequencies. Now this is probably one of the most critical things for a drone pilot, uh, is knowing where you are, what airspace you're in, sort of if you are having an airband radio on your belt, what frequency should you be listening to to keep an eye and an ear out? As, Ka as, uh, as CASA call it, we call it in aviation, maintain a listen and watch. So we spend probably a good half day or more just on those maps. What do those maps look like? Here's one now. So this map is a what we call a VNC, Visual Navigational Chart. This one happens to be of Sydney region, so it's got Sydney and Canberra on board. And it shows us, you can have a look at it, it's got all these pretty colored lines and circles and dashes. And look, when you first look at it, it's quite daunting. Uh, but when we get down to the nitty gritty of it, it is really the starting point for a commercial drone op. The, the, op, the operator wants to know exactly what airspace he's in, and then we can move on from there because Look at all the red zones, restricted. So a lot of these zones require approval to fly in. Sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off. You need to know where to look that up. We go through the URSA, how to look up what the URSA is as an en route supplement, big thick book. Uh, we go through looking up the details for that, who to contact, how to contact, how to put the, uh, the applications in, all that stuff. Sydney Harbour, for instance, another classic example. Two restricted airspaces each side of the bridge. Um, no fly zones without approval. So we do all that, we spend virtually a good half day on that uh, alone, just on maps and airspace. You can't learn it in half an hour, there is too much to, to digest, way too much. Uh, so that's pretty much day one, we'll be covering uh, all the terminologies, the airspace requirements and, and some other bits and pieces to tag on the end. Uh, second day, generally we go out in the morning, weather permitting, and we will fly. We spend a whole, whole morning flying out in the field right up to lunchtime as I said, weather permitting. We aim for three flying mornings on our five day course. Back in the afternoon uh, of the second day, we're back into the classroom. And depending on the weather, we don't often go in order of the book. I often tell my students, we'll, we'll go backwards and forwards through the book. We very rarely play the book out in order because sometimes it's just not convenient. And day two might be taken up with the actual training around the multi-rotors themselves. So we start digesting all the information about the, the Phantoms and the Inspires. We start talking about mission planning, risk assessments, pr uh, flight 
um, flight checklists, all the stuff that goes around um, getting your drone from the box to the air, including stuff like LiPo batteries and, and all that sort of stuff. And that pretty much will go for the entire afternoon. Um, so we, we cover all bases, um, not just the physical thing about the drone, but the actual mission itself and all of the threats and, and anything that goes with it, and people and birds and dogs and cats and whatever else might interfere with your drone operation, tagged on top of the airspace requirements that we went through in the day before. So now we're at Wednesday morning, third, third morning, back out in the flying field, weather permitting, uh, spend all morning flying again. We drag enough batteries around this country to fly all morning. Um, so we have three aircraft in the air, generally at any given course, six guys on a course, one aircraft per pair. Because part of the, the practical flight stuff is also teaching the guy who's n who doesn't have the controller in his hand. So he's, or she, is the ground crew, the spotter, the, the co-pilot. Um, we actually have syllabus that we discuss and what those roles are and what the responsibilities are for the person who doesn't actually have the controller in their hand. They're not just going to sit here and play Facebook. Their job is as important as the pilot. The pilot gets what we call loaded and that is his or her attention is, is already stretched, keeping an eye on what's going on, getting the shot, flying the drone, keeping it out of trouble. The person standing next to them also has an important job. So that's the third morning. Back into the classroom after lunch. And we're back into the theory. Uh, Wednesday afternoon comprises of, uh, depending on the weather again, we juggle around, but it can be anything from looking at NOTAMs, which is uh, notice to M. And if you're not sure what that is, Google it, look it up. It's like a bulletin board system for us pilots uh, and, and drone pilots as well. Um, we, we may look at operational meteorology, which is understanding uh, aviation-based weather forecasting and reporting. So not just looking up the Bureau's website and going, oh, sunny and 25 degrees, we're talking TAFs, Terminal Area Aerodrome Forecasts and Area Forecasts and uh, Meteorological Aerodrome Reports, or METARS for short. You'll actually be taught how to read these highly abbreviated and, and somewhat Fibonacci sequenced uh, information that's coming out of aerodromes and whatnot else about the weather that's happening in and around those, those terminals and in where you are. So not just Willy Weather. Willy Weather's a great app, don't get me wrong, but it's not the be all and end all of what you should be doing as a drone pilot when it comes to weather. Uh, that will lead into the afternoon, which is AROC. Wednesday afternoon, we do AROC. Now, AROC for us is a big deal. Um, it's about three or four hours from start to finish, depending how quickly we get through it. And it's everything from not only using the airband radio and understanding what it's about, but understanding how to communicate with another aviator. Remember, at the end of our course, you are going to become an aviator in this world of aviation. And you need to start thinking aviator. Uh, we teach you how to speak on the radio, we teach you the, you know, the phonetic alphabet if you're not familiar with it, not, that's not too difficult, but we teach you how to talk to another aviator, the phraseology you use, and, and look, let's face it, if we want respect as drone pilots entering the aviation world, we need to respect the world that we're walking into. And by that, speaking correctly on a radio is important. People's lives depend on this air band that we're talking. Picking the radio up, breaker, breaker, one, nine, hey, I'm flying a drone, doesn't work, all right? So we go through that. Not only that, we go through circuits around non-towered aerodromes. They're the aerodromes where drone pilots are most likely to put their drone up. It's not gonna be near the towered ones, it's near the non-towered ones. And so we talk about circuits, what way the circuits run, how wide are the circuits, how high are the circuits. What a circuit actually is, is how an aeroplane lands at a non-towered aerodrome. They don't just fly in willy-nilly and put it down, there's, a, there's actually a way that it happens. We talk about that. We talk about where you might be in the circuit and how to work out where you are in the circuit based on the radio calls you're hearing. And then you'll know exactly where you are in relation to where these planes are operating in and around you. So we go through all of that and all that mumbo jumbo about where they're gonna be, how they're gonna be there, what heights, what widths, where, how, when you call them, when not to call, how to make broadcasts. We teach you how to make those broadcasts confidently. Uh, and there's an exam at the end of it, a little, uh, little exam. I wouldn't call it an intense exam. It's a, more than like a quiz, just to make sure you've got your head around things. And uh, that wraps up Wednesday. Thursday morning, back out in the field again, weather permitting, drones in the air, running through all the advanced stuff of drone flight, attitude mode, off axis flying, how to reorientate the aircraft in the air, all that stuff that goes with, uh-oh, I've lost GPS, or uh-oh, my iPad has died, it got too hot in the sun, what do I do now, handing over to you, spider if all of a sudden you're starting to get a bit of heat stroke, you're not feeling it. So all the contingencies, remember, I've said this many times before, aviation is sort of centralized around worst case scenario. So we do the same thing, worst case scenario, what if the pilot becomes incapacitated for whatever reason, and you've got an M600 in the air? I mean, 
<laughs> think about that, right? Emergency response procedures. What happens if the drone crashes? Who does what? Who goes where? We've got a whole bunch of videos that we go through in the classroom. Um, things like lipo battery fires in cars. I've got videos that are just insane. Uh, people crashing in cities with drones that they should never have even been flying in and what they do and, and should have done and didn't do. Now, all that sort of stuff comes into play. Thursday afternoon, again, depending on the weather, oh sorry, at the end of that, uh, at the end of the third day's session of flying, there is a practical flight demonstration where you are put through as a student, a demonstration that shows me that you have an ability to control this aircraft to a level that CASA has deemed appropriate. We sign off on that should you get through that and we move on. Beautiful. After lunch, back in the classroom where we will tidy up uh, the last bits of the theory and they include things like fixed wing, uh, going through fixed wing and aerodynamics and how things fly in general. Um, that, that is important. We're not just flying multi-rotors here. We're, if we're going to walk into the world of aviation and drones in general, then we really should have an understanding of how the other side, the dark side of drones work, the fixed wing, for instance. So we'll go through that. And then we'll walk into an entire job from start to finish. A full job safety assessment, a full mission plan, go through the whole box and dice so that you as the student know what's required the minute you hang the phone up from your client that says, hey, I want you to come and put a drone up over somewhere. The entire process from job safety assessment, risk assessment, looking at the airspace, can I fly here, who do I call, who do I contact, where do I get the approvals if need be. How do I do all of these bits and pieces? Threat and error management, getting the crew on board, who you're gonna need, where is it, is it high risk? All that stuff. That'll take up the rest of that day. Friday morning, the plan, if it all goes, to, uh, goes well, is we do recap. We go through all of the stuff we went through during the week. We pull the maps back out again, we have a look at the maps. Uh, we, we talk about NOTAMs and, and meteorology and whatever it is that you know, some people might have have uh, had fall out of their ears, because let me tell you, there's a fair bit of information that gets pumped into your brain between Monday and Thursday. So Friday's a bit of a recap, Friday morning's a bit of a recap, get your head back around it again, get back in the game, and then we hit you with an exam Friday afternoon. The exam is a written exam uh, of 100, worth 100 points, so uh, it's not just a 10 question uh, tick and flick. It's a fairly serious exam, and it takes about two and a half to three hours to complete, depending on your experience levels. So that's it in a nutshell, I guess. That's what happens on our five-day course. Um, a lot of organizations sort of play their cards close to their chest, and that's fine, but um, we keep getting asked the same question. What am I gonna learn? What do we do? Well, there it all is in, in Technicolor for you. That's what happens on our courses. Uh, we spend five good days training. Can you get that in a two-day course, a three-day course? I'm not sure how. There is a fair bit to get through. Um, meteorology alone is an entire section in our, in our book. Now thankfully, moving forward, that's gonna be scaled back a little bit because there's a lot of information in there that's probably not quite relevant. So we actually go through and dig out the stuff that is relevant and, and we run you through that because some of it is important. Um, no TAMs, operational meteorology, threat and error management, human factors, they're all important things. And they're, they're sort of stuff that you sort of need to have, in my opinion, you need to have an instructor at the front of the classroom who can actually convey this stuff with you. It's, it's very similar to the manned aircraft world. It's the same threats, it's the same uh, errors, that's, human factors are the same. There's not a lot of difference. The only difference, I guess, is we're not sitting in it. Um, I'm a manned aircraft pilot now, going through that, as you well know, and it, it really is hand in hand. Um, so I hope that's given you some insight. Uh, look, do your research, do your homework. Um, just know that it's CASA that sent this, set this benchmark. So we as flight schools are supposed to meet that benchmark and then those of us that choose to go above and beyond that benchmark do so. Um, that's what we aim to do. We aim to go above and beyond the benchmark. There's nothing in the syllabus I remember that talks about um, running through job safety assessment and doing a whole mission and planning it out. But we do that as, as a responsible thing for our student because it's important. We don't want to just send you out there and go, right, they're the rules and the regs, you pass your exam, off you go. We want to try and give you some real life experience so that you understand what you're going to have to do once you step outside the classroom and you've been given your certification. And this is the thing that sort of scares me as an instructor. Once you've got that certification, there's no more checks and balances. Other than the audit that happens on the OC every three years, there's, there's, there's no, it's not like a driver's license where you've got to go back down and renew it every year and they give you an eye test. There's nothing. Your REPL, as it's now called, Remote Pilot's License, is perpetual at this point. So I want to make sure as an instructor that you're leaving as prepared as I can possibly make you. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to fire them away. 
Um, John at FPV Australia is my email address. I got sort of uh, tagged for saying it all too quickly on the last video. So John at fpvaustralia.com.au is my email address. Uh, www.fpvaustralia oh, down the bottom of the screen .com.au is our uh, website. If you want to call us, you can. Um, you can call the office here on 02 61128551 or you can email uh, training at fpvaustralia.com.au so there's all the way that you can ways that you can get in touch with us. My only advice to you all, if you are seeking to become certified, now it doesn't matter if you're gonna fly sub two kilo or you wanna fly the bigger machines, if you are thinking on becoming certified, I, I really implore you to do your research. Ring around, ask around, email around, take your time to find out what and who is best for you. There's schools in every state now, and just like me, I travel the state, I'm in every state as well. So chances are there is somewhere close to you that you can get trained. But just because it's close, doesn't mean it's the best. Do your research, ring around, talk to people online who've already been through training schools and get their opinion. I guess that's, that's the best way of doing research. Don't take my word for it that we're the best. Don't take someone else's word for it. Find out for yourself who is the best for you. As I say, got any questions, let us know. I hope that's cleared that up for you. I hope it's given you a bit of an insight on what happens in a busy week on a training school. It's a fairly busy week, it's fairly intense. Um, it's intense for us as trainers. Uh, and it's intense for you guys as students. This is a serious course and I don't know how you can knock it out in a few days. Uh, that's just my opinion, you make up your own. Until next time, uh, safe skies for all. If you are flying a drone, please do so responsibly. Enjoy.